just to say that Dr. Samuel, um, you know, who is faculty here and runs the outpatient center is a, uh, a legend at Beth Israel as somebody I've known since before I got here as somebody who was held up as a, um, a prime example of high quality uh, physicians and expert cardiologists. And we are thrilled to have him here today uh, to present to us about atherosclerosis. Take it away, Dr. Samuel. Wow, well, I, am, I am humbled. Uh, I don't know if I would have ever described myself as a legend, but uh, thank you so much. Obviously, this is a subject dear to my heart. Uh, I have been practicing uh, cardiology for 25 years, uh, and I uh, pride myself at having a very uh, um, uh, reasonable cardiology practice. Uh, and I, I wanted to share my view of uh, atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. Um, uh, I guess my only disclosure is that uh, is that I have been touched by coronary artery disease in, in, in many of uh, my friends and family members. A lot of people had to untimely suffer from uh, heart attacks and strokes that I know whether in my personal life and in, uh, in my family as well as my patients. So my interest goes beyond uh, uh, just dealing with patients, um, but uh, it's uh, I think it's a, it's a condition and the disease that probably touched many of you as well in one way or another. Um, uh, heart disease is quite uh, prevalent. Uh, if you look at uh, here, I don't know if you could see my uh, my uh, arrow when I point as well or not, but. Uh, uh, I don't understand how this stuff works, but uh, all cardiovascular diseases, probably 40% uh, of the population will have some form of heart disease by age, by 2030, around 10% coronary artery disease and close to 4% strokes and maybe 4% heart failure. Um, uh, most of the heart failure, a large majority of the heart failure has something to do with atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, uh, systolic heart failure will be a result, and even some of the diastolic heart failure will have component of atherosclerosis. Strokes, not all of them are atherosclerotic, some are embolic, but even AFib have the grounds of it could be also atherosclerosis. So in general, you could think of atherosclerosis as contributing to the majority of those three diagnoses that we, we have over here. And um, the cost of this is, is really uh, uh, staggering. So $818 billion would be spent on cardiovascular care in 2030, close to 100 billion for each strokes, uh, coronary artery disease, and almost the same for heart failure. Uh, and obviously in a, in a, in a, in a election year where everybody is talking about programs in that trillion, 800 uh, billion is, uh, is a high number. Add to it that there is another 300 billions of unearned wages from sudden cardiac death and disability due to stroke and heart failure. So we're now talking over a 1 trillion cost. And to put it into context, the whole medical outlay uh, in the last year that we have a budget for it is 600 billion. So it's uh, take all the money of Medicare, double it, and uh, and basically put it all into cardiac care. And now you could forget about cancer, infections, uh, COVID, any other problem would. Uh, so obviously, non-sustainable. Uh, costs, very staggering. And the main reason for that high cost is that we are dealing with the disease, the stents, the bypass, the reduced LV functions, the defibrillators, the heart transplants, the impellers, the expensive stuff. We, we, have, we owe it to our country and to our patients and to our family members that we do a better job at prevention. And, and this is a very... Uh, uh, like I'm sure all of you have seen this paper, the uh, 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 primary prevention guidelines by the American uh, College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. They put it in September of 2019. And uh, it, it, uh, it covers uh, a current feeling of prevention based on the available evidence. 
And I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, with the slides of this presentation. I'm going to touch on it very quickly and then move to what I want to describe. So obviously, the seven metrics of cardiovascular health is, is, is those seven, avoiding the injury, uh, injurious effect of tobacco smoking, um, eating uh, a good diet, uh, hopefully vegetables, fruits, nuts, fish, uh, legumes, but avoid processed meat, saturated fat, refined carbohydrate. Um, you need to exercise regularly. So in a week, we want you to do 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. Hopefully your cholesterol will be within the normal range without medicine. Your blood pressure is below 120 and below 80 and you're, uh, you're, you're not diabetic and you're not overweight or obese. Uh, would be great if we all can achieve this throughout our adulthood, but unfortunately, only fewer than 5% can maintain all those seven metrics throughout our adulthood. So we, we have to intervene, and uh, as much as we can influence the tobacco smoke and the diet and the exercise, by there is no medication for those except maybe tobacco smoke. But the others may have to be achieved only by, by medication or surgery or other interventions. So, um, so we will address the cholesterol in the stroke, but I'll touch a little bit on, uh, on high blood pressure. So uh, you are all familiar with this very complex slides, and, uh, and I'm not sure when we, you, you actually spend the time looking at it in details. I'll try to just uh, summarize it for you. The, Recommendation is that if your LDL is above 190, you should be on medicine. And we finally moved to starting early in those people, which is the right thing to do. And I'll explain how in the future, but that's an easy one. We're gonna start high intensity statin. If you have familial hypercholesteremia, which is usually reflected by an LDL above 190. Um, if you are diabetic above the age of 30, 40, between 40 and 75 with an LDL of 70, there is recommendation to start statin and you could decide on moderate or choose to go to high intensity. After that, it's really confusing. It tells you that you have to use a calculator. And if it's more than 20% 10, ris 10 year risk, you should start that. Uh, it doesn't tell you how much statin, but they tell you you should start that. And that would be a class one. If you have more than seven and a half, you, you should consider it if there is a risk enhancer, which is the list that are on the left over there. We can go over it a little uh, later. Uh, but then they give you an out. Like if the patient really doesn't want it, maybe you shouldn't. You could try to do a calcium score first and we'll see what that means. Between five and seven and a half, they say you should consider maybe uh, talk to the patient and see what he wants if there is a risk enhancer again. And below 5% don't offer a statin. Uh, if any of you try to uh, use a calculator, you, you'll start to wonder, like me, how could this calculator be accurate? It's from the Framingham. That's the available evidence. And that's usually the limitation of this kind of research, is that whatever someone did, we now have proof for it. So let's try to use it. But uh, in your mind, you, do you think of a person who smoke as either he smoked or non-smoked? If, uh, if, if someone smoked two cigarettes per day uh, until now for the last seven, eight years compared to someone who smoked three packs per day for the last 30 years, are they the same? How could the, in the calculator both of them be the same? Diabetes is yes or no. It's like, uh, how about someone who's taking 500 of metformin and the A1C is 6.2, and another one is taking four medication and the A1C is nine. Um, the blood pressure is only discussing the reading for today and whether he's on medicine or not. But if it's been there for the last 20 years and the patient is on four medication, how could that be the same? And if you have family history of heart disease, uh, it's only a risk enhancer. It's not even in the formula. Uh, something that makes you wonder if that calculator could be really accurate in detecting heart disease. So here is a case. Those are two cases I got the fellows to help me. So they pick two cases with, uh, um, from morning report that we present every morning at 7.30. You're all invited to join. And here is a 53 year old who felt great until an hour ago. He never really, he has family history of heart disease. 
Today's blood pressure is 130 over 80. He never had history of high blood pressure, never smoked, non-diabetic, and he's having an inferior wall MI. And uh, he turned out to have an occluded uh, circumflex, which is this vessel here. It's, uh, it's an AV groove vessel. It's going to go to the back wall and give a PDA, and it's occluded completely here. And he also had a long lesion in the LED. And I intentionally put those uh, statements that this vessel here is what won the race. And uh, this LED here has another lesion. And I want to talk for a second about this, even though it's a little off topic, just for you to understand how atherosclerosis really work. Um, so for this LED lesion, which has symmetry flow through the LED, uh, if this patient came to us in the office saying, when I walk fast, I have angina, and we put him on a treadmill and he had a positive stress test, and then we cast him and we found that 70% uh, lesion, we would tell him we, if we open that artery, we're opening it only uh, to prevent your angina. We never can prove that we decrease a heart attack when we open a vessel like this. But for this patient who is presenting with a heart attack in the circumflex, he is demonstrating that he is particularly more inflamed than anybody else with regular coronary artery disease. So in a way, think of coronary artery disease as not all one disease. Some people have more uh, uh, factors that gives them a, a higher incidence of events. And the one who has the highest incidence of event is the one who had one event uh, recently because he probably have all his vessels inflamed to the same degree. So in a way, both the circumflex and the LED a week ago probably looked the same and they were both inflamed. The circ beat the LED, gave him the infarct, but the LED could be right around the corner ready to give the next infarct. And the only time revascularizing other vessels uh, uh, proved to reduce the risk of heart attacks is when we are revascularizing other lesions in a patient who came in with unstable angina or NMI, usually ST elevation MI. So I would stand this LED because I know it could rupture its plaque and cause the heart attack in the next month or two. And probably that's the reason why we feel that uh, we, we know that 80 milligrams of Lipitor, which is can work as an anti-inflammatory, is much better than a smaller dose of statin after NMI, and that's why in cure, you could give aspirin and Plavix for a year, even if you don't put a stent, because if a plaque ruptures, the depth or the dual antiplatelet may actually prevent the MI in that sense. So I just wanted to give you a feel that coronary artery disease cannot be one size fit all. The patient who is inflamed, who have events, is a completely different animal than a patient with stable coronary artery disease coming with angina. If that's the case, how could we tailor the treatment with single digit numbers? So we'll go back to our talk. And this patient's LDL number, if any of you looked at it, 83, you probably would have told him, I wish you would have, I, have you, uh, I would have your LDL if you saw him in the office a week before his heart attack. So his family history of heart disease, 53. And when you calculate his risk, he falls in the below 5% that you would have never offered him statin. What I want you to think about, would we have failed this man if he came to us a week before and we would have told him, you look good, uh, yeah, you have family history, continue to exercise, you have no symptoms. I would not treat this. I would, I would be happy if this cholesterol is mine. That is not the case. The man went ahead a week later and had a heart attack. Uh, even worse, this woman is 37. She is obese. She doesn't have any risk factors. She comes in with ST elevation in the inferior lead. She has a totally occluded right coronary. And later, she came up with an A1C at 6.5, very common uh, that patients show the, uh, the insulin resistant or diabetic, uh, uh, even after the presentation of a heart attack. Those are her numbers, 118 LDL. Uh, and when we calculated her risk and I had to change her age to 40 because at age 37, I couldn't do it. She actually has um, a, a, a risk of 1% and a total of 1.9 when I added diabetes. So, so I guess the, 
the calculator didn't read the document. By document, if she was non-diabetic, she would have needed that. And so I asked my fellows many, many times to sit and do uh, a retrospective analysis of the patient that come to our hospital with acute MI and see if they, uh, if they, uh, if the calculators would have detected them before. Because whenever we present a case, I ask them to go to go through the formula, and and we see that many of them wouldn't have been called by the risk calculator. So of course, when you want to do something, the fellows first of all don't do it. The second is that there is someone else who had done it, and this paper is from uh, India, South Asians. And out of 1,110 patients, you could see they tried three risk calculators, ours, the Canadian, and this one here is the European Q-risk. And Q-risk at 10%, it comes in 10 and 20. It, it actually caught a little more, but still 25% are, are, are missing. Uh, the Canadian is, is, is atrocious, like 44% positive, meaning 55% were missed by the Canadian in the study, but you you would say common sense. South Asian are not like us. Uh, they're not uh, the same. They, 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 the whites here have a problem. They, uh, they have higher LDL. The South, uh, the, the South Asian have lower LDL. Uh, they tend to have low HDL, have high triglyceride. None of them is in the calculator. Uh, the, the HDL is. And, and if they gain two pounds, they become diabetic. So maybe that's why our, the calculator tested in, in whites wouldn't apply to, to South Asian. How about this? This is a European paper uh, from Denmark. And uh, it proved what we all thought is that it catches patients above age 60. Um, it catches women less above age 60. It doesn't do well at all below the age of 60. And forget it, for women below the age of 30, uh, 60, uh, seven, it's a seven and a half percent cutoff to start statin would have caught only 10% of women who would later go and get heart attacks. 90% of women that come to your practice that are about to have a heart attack, you wouldn't have given them a statin based on the evaluation that you had a week before their heart attack. So obviously the calculators are not able to detect this. Um, so just to give you an idea if why is a 60 years old uh, and on get uh, given a statin, if, if you take a 60 year old uh, white male who never smoked, non-diabetic with a decent blood pressure, I had to put 130 to get to seven and a half. So he's hypertensive, but look at that LDL 80, HDL 40 total is 140. And he already qualified to be offered the statin at seven and a half. If he was African-American, he would have been 8.8 .8 at 60. He would have been offered the statin at 58. A, a woman with the same numbers would be offered uh, the statin at 68. So the elderly will all get offered the statin. That's what the calculator does. Um, we said the prevalence of coronary artery disease is 10%. That's symptomatic coronary artery disease. I'll show you literature that the prevalence of atherosclerosis is somewhere between 50 and 80%. So there is no doubt in my mind when we are offering statin to all people above age 60, we are over treating some of the elderly. I don't mind, but we are over treating some of the elderly. I think we, on the other hand, are way under treating the younger people. And the limitation, as I said, is that the blood pressure is one reading, the smoking is a yes or no, the diabetes is yes or no. That doesn't make sense. So someone thought that there have to be better way to calculate or look at the risk. And one of them is like, what if we have uh, already some evidence of atherosclerosis on the arteries? Maybe that can help define the risk. So obviously the three ways that you could look at the arteries are uh, the carotid IMT, which is the CIMT, and I'll call it IMT to make it easy from now on because it's a tongue twister is the presence or absence of carotid plaque and the presence or absence of coronary calcium. The coronary calcium was the only one studied enough to say zero between zero and 100 and above 300 and then uh, 100 to 300 and above. Um, this picture here is, I want to spend a lot of time on this picture. Uh, so please uh, 
uh, focus with me. This is here is where we are all born, I hope, without any atherosclerosis. Uh, the cholesterol, which is mainly made by our liver, very little come from our diet, um, uh, unfortunately. So we can't really beat uh, a, a familial hypercholesterolemia or a tendency to have high cholesterol by, by just eating healthy. It's sometimes not enough. Uh, we'll develop, deliver uh, atherogenic molecules, mainly the LDL, but also the lipoprotein little a, some ApoB. All of this is atherogenic cholesterol molecule. I'll just call it LDL to make it easy. And the LDL would get pushed by certain factors. The blood pressure will push it in. The endothelium gets sick by the hypertension, by the diabetes. And the endothelial that gets sick from the diabetes actually affects usually the whole arterial tree, including the smaller artery. Not the case for smoking. It tells you another part of why things are not individual. A diabetic person and South Asian person may have endothelial dysfunction allowing the cholesterol to build in the whole arterial tree, including the distal arteries. Um, and uh, inflammation, some other markers, uh, the uh, chronic kidney disease, all the uh, family history tendency that makes that endothelial sick and, uh, and allow more cholesterol to build in the artery. But what I want you to remember is that no matter what your LDL is, the actual substrate that builds plaque in the artery is still the LDL. What I'm trying to say is never kid yourself to say that the LDL is low and hence the patient will not have atherosclerosis. So if they have endothelial dysfunction and have something that allows the cholesterol to build in the artery, it's still using whatever little LDL that they have and one way to prevent the progression of the atherosclerosis in everybody is to make deplete the substrate of the plaque, which is the LDL, meaning that no matter how low it is, if it's in the arteries, you need to lower it to slow down the buildup in the arteries because it is still the final substrate that's being used to form the plaque. As the plaque progresses, this is decades, we know that there is fatty streaks in the teens, minimal plaque is seen in many autopsies in the 20s, and then uh, the stenosis eventually reaches 70 or 80 percent and becomes symptomatic when we exert ourselves. So a 50 to 60 percent stenosis or buildup doesn't go give any symptoms. You could be feeling like a million bucks, you just came back from the gym or ran a marathon, and you feel good about yourself, but your arteries have 50% build up and you don't know. When you go above 75 to 80, if you are in tune with your body and you could tell that when you exert yourself that something is not right, I have some tightness, as soon as you slow down and a lot of us uh, by, by uh, tendency to want to survive when we feel bad, we just decide to slow down. We may not even notice why we slowed down and you wouldn't even understand that what you're having is angina. If you're well uh, uh, smart enough to figure it out, you might get an evaluation and you get uh, a stress test and we'll, we get that LED that looks uh, obstructive, but you're not in a dire situation. Unfortunately, um, a few of us will, uh, will, will have a plaque rupture. That usually happens on top of a 60% stenosis, not, nothing less than that. It tends to be a plaque that progressed in the last couple of months to 60% and then it ruptures. And because it ruptured, now the inside of the plaque, I'd like to describe to my patients, the gooey stuff inside the pimple or the gooey stuff inside the grape get exposed to the blood cells. And now we get a thrombus to form on top of the broken skin of the plaque uh, or on top of that pimple. And uh, if we are thrombogenic because we smoked or we didn't take the aspirin for that day, the blood may clot and may close the artery, but that's not always what happens. Uh, I'm not naive. I know that there are millions of times that plaque ruptures and the thrombus doesn't form. It's only uh, in a few occasions when all the uh, stars are aligned is when we actually get a thrombus. And when you occlude the artery, all of a sudden from 60 to 100%, uh, there, there will be lesser time for collateral to build between a branch before the blockage and a branch after. And that's when we get an ST elevation MI. And unfortunately, one out of four 
who get this ST elevation and might just die in their sleep or in the house or in the uh, gym or, or in the park and don't make it to the hospital. So, uh, and then the few that come or the, seven, the majority that come, they will be damaged. So they may have to live with a reduced LV function and now they need defibrillators, they have heart failure and so on. Uh, if we start here, high intensity statin, we already, the horse is out of the barn. In addition to the artery that's closed now, there are probably many, many arteries that have similar things in the arteries of the brain, the kidneys, the legs. So now I have PVD, I have carotid artery stenosis. You cannot really wait to start here and become more intense. Our calculator wants us to go back 10 years and try to predict the risk of events for 10 years. 10 years is right about here. Like this started at age 10. So when we are looking at events saying that at age 60, they're gonna have their heart attack, we want to see the 10 year risk going up and we want to start right around here to start giving a statin. I think of this like a train going up to a, to a cliff and it's gonna fall off of the cliff. Right here, the train hasn't left the station yet. And that's where primordial infection uh, prevention comes. And I'll explain that later. But when I start seeing the, the train moving on the track, I don't want to wait till it come closer to the cliff and try to stop it. It makes no sense to me that I want to detect the 10 year risk and I start here. If I see that you're already on the track moving and heading towards the cliff, I want to start to slow that train from here, not all the way to there. And I'll go into this later when I show you the examples of when we expect to have the heart attack. So basically primary prevention is here and the calculator wants us to wait till we come close to the cliff to stop the medicine. We agreed that there are so many mistakes with the calculators because it's, it's not really individualizing to the patient who's inflamed with HIV, hepatitis C, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, eczema. All those patients gout have, have higher risks than others. We don't look at them, they're enhancers, but we really don't uh, put them into our calculation to see if we should give medicine or not. And we decided we're gonna try to see if there is already atherosclerosis and we're gonna look at the calcium score uh, many, many studies, MESA is one of the major studies that looked at all atherosclerotic uh, evidence, calcium score as, as well as others. And you get nice graphs here, 50, 75%, 90% that uh, tell us um, uh, where the patient lies relative to other people at his age. Uh, many other studies, Rotterdam, HNR, Framingham, uh, Cardia looked at young people and saw that it's not uncommon to have a calcium score that's not zero in those patients and it's strongly predicted heart disease. And initially Mesa said it's more common in whites, but Jackson Heart sh showed that if you added calcium score to African-American, it, it improved the risk prediction uh, more than, uh, than just using the risk factors. The Women uh, Health Initiative showed the same thing that CAC improved uh, the detectability of disease beyond the traditional risk factors. So this was proposed in 2018, and it basically said, if you are in those intermediate risk category, you should do the CAC to see. Um, the uh, 2019 guideline came and actually wanted you to do it only if you're seven and a half to 20. So they actually wanted those people to, to not get a CAC, like they, they, they only recommended it here. Um, so MESA here did, uh, this here showed you, uh, that graph here, the receiver operator characteristic uh, curve moved more towards the left. So this area under the curve got bigger, that indicates that uh, you, you could detect or discriminate better uh, if the patient needs uh, beyond just using the risk factors. So the red line is the risk factors, the blue is the risk factor plus CAC, and it does improve the discrimination. And MESA did this calculator. Now it added, in addition to sex uh, and age, we added what's the calcium score. And since it varies between different uh, ethnicities and races, we wanted you to pick, to pick the race uh, 
continue with diabetes, yes, no smoking, yes, no, but add family history of heart attack, which wasn't in the original calculator, and you could calculate a MESA 10-year risk. It will be different than uh, uh, the one that we are using. Uh, how about this? This is a carotid artery duplex. Uh, this is the uh, intima over here and over here. This here is more than 50% more than this, and it measured more than one and a half millimeters. So this is a plaque. And of course, if it's calcified like this part here in the center of the screen, or this calcified plaque in the new wall, it tells you that this is plaque. So that's how we look at plaque in the carotid artery. There is many, many trials done to assess for carotid artery screening. Most of them try to do the IMT. It was a big thing to call people your you're 50, but your, cardio, your vascular age is 60. It's all based on your IMT. So if you have more thick uh, intima media, you probably have an older artery than if you had a thin intima media. The problem is that there are so many trials and so uh, very different ages, some young, some older, and the duration is, is insane. Like the longest is 10 years, there is one 12 years, but it's very short. For a carotid plaque or IMT to show difference uh, with events, it may not uh, show it. And the biggest thing is that a lot of them excluded plaque, plaque excluded, plaque excluded. What they did is that when they measured the intima, and there are patients that have thin intima and the plaque, they see the plaque and they ignore it and say the intima is thin and they report the patient as low risk. And of course that patient can have event. It loses the discrimination right away. And it, so many of them excluded plaque. They were just looking at IMT. Uh, those are the studies that actually looked at plaque and I, I did a few of them. It's impossible to get the idea. Everything is different. What's the plaque thickness? What define the plaque? Uh, what I told you is the final thing that we use in our lab is one and a half millimeter or 50% increase from the adjacent area. And if it's calcified, that's not the case at all. Each one of those studies have a different definition of plaque and very short duration. And as a result, the predictability was not as reliable. Plus there isn't as much money in carotid duplex to try to publish as much as the CT scan. So unfortunately, the uh, IMT, because of the confusion, and that's how you detect the IMT, uh, uh, we know that it's terrible in the common carotid because the plaque tend to build in the ICA and the bulb. So the IMT in 2013, the American College of Cardiology decided that it's not worth using to differentiate in cardiovascular risk. So IMT is out. Uh, but I would beg to say that if you look at some studies, there is no doubt it's as good as CT scan in one way. So this is a, is a Eric study, and you could see here there is no IMT or less than 25th percentile and no plaque. And then if you combine more than 75th percentile and yes plaque, and of course it's significant. I will show you a couple of other studies. This is a study from Korea where they believe in carotid duplex a lot. They have a plaque showing significant statistical significance. It is very significant just for IMT, even if the common carotid artery. Uh, these are the pictures that I wanted to show you. Here is a plaque, but this IMT is normal. If you measure this and report it as normal, you're just ignoring the fact that there is a mountain of plaque over there. And that patient, if he goes and get a vent, he would basically mess up your results of any IMT. This patient has plaque, but his IMT is a little significant. This patient here was very calcified plaque. If you measure his IMT in this area, it may not be so big. Here is a lot of plaque, including plaque in the area of the IMT, and that changes the measurement. So it, it just shows you that plaque and IMT is, is, is def like if you have any of this, how could you say that I'm not gonna try to treat a patient with this much atherosclerosis or this patient with this much atherosclerosis. Uh, so in this article here, they basically proposed that we should look at it and they started to get smart. They started to say that the plaque morphology make a huge difference. And ecolucent plaque is well known to cause more embolization, more events. And maybe we should tailor our treatment to the morphology of the plaque. We have an opportunity to look at the plaque and we can see the calcified dense plaque is usually very stable, but the ecolucent, very soft plaque, especially the one that you don't see, I'll show you pictures, 
Those are very dangerous. And the other thing they suggested is the black burden. Can we measure the amount? Like not say mere yes or no, like diabetes. We treat it like a poorly controlled diabetes should carry more weight than uh, uh, easily controlled. And the same thing, a small amount of plaque should be completely different than a larger amount of plaque. And they are basically uh, uh, doing something that I like a lot, which is they came up and said, maybe plaque progression and regression should be a more powerful method to assess the effect of therapy. Again, common sense. Those are available things to us. The 3D ultrasound we have in Union Square, I don't use it. I use other ways to measure progression and regression, but we will talk about it. But the concept makes a lot of sense. We have the ability to see this. How could we treat risk factors and not treat arteries? And they basically said, please consider in, your, in the future guideline to include those things like plaque burden, plaque morphology. This is how they measure plaque burden by 3D. It have different cuts and it can calculate the volume of the plaque. Um, so bioimage is actually a study by, by uh, Dr. Fuster, our people here, and, uh, and, and it, it looked at carotid ultrasound using a new toy that he had a three-dimensional uh, uh, vascular ultrasound. I have it now, but this was many years back. And with the 3D ultrasound, he found prevalence of disease of 78%. So that's when I was telling you that treating all the elderly may not be so bad. It's because the majority of us will have atherosclerosis if we look at the arteries. So about 78%, and his was not an elderly study. They had young people. 67% in Rotterdam, he was comparing, saying like, I got 78, the closest to us was a sub-study of Rotterdam that had 67%. Uh, uh, this is what I want you to pay attention to. It's a complex slide. Uh, in the bioimage, they looked at calcium score. They looked at uh, uh, plaque burden and plaque uh, presence. And they looked at uh, IMT, which didn't uh, have much value. Aortic aneurysm, uh, you understand if the atherosclerosis happened in the small artery, it closes. If it happened in the big artery, it dilates. It weakens it, and it could become aneurysmal. So aortic aneurysm is part of atherosclerosis, but he only found aneurysm in about uh, uh, 4% of 1% of the subject that he looked at. And I am uh, an ABI, which measures the flow in the legs, was was positive only in 10%. So if we look at the two slides, I want you to look at uh, look at the zero calcium and the no plaque. There is 2,800 zero calcium, but only 1,300 uh, no plaque, meaning that there is a lot more patients with plaque in the carotid uh, than, uh, than uh, patients with calcium score. So detecting plaque in the carotid artery preceded uh, the presence of calcium. And he's basically telling the story of atherosclerosis here, and he's saying, it, eventually, the calcium will be deposited in the coronary artery, and therefore, we. it was interesting to notice that there was considerable number of participants with no coronary calcium who had carotid plaque was present. And it makes sense, right? Like, you, you, the plaque happened in the carotid and the coronary around the same time, but it's soft still in the carotid and you could see it by the ultrasound, but you couldn't see it on the calcium score for another 10 years until it calcifies. So it's quite reasonable to think that carotid duplex will likely detect plaque in patients who still have zero calcium score. And he proposed that the 3D is uh, more sensitive than 2D. So maybe we can uh, look at, uh, at 3D to quantify the plaque. So again, talking about plaque burden, he didn't mention that you should follow it longitudinally. So the Korean thought ahead of us and, and said, maybe we can monitor it and follow it. Uh, these are pictures from our labs. This is uh, courtesy of uh, Jan Sloves. I'm not sure if you, you know our uh, vascular lab uh, 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 director. He's a uh, vascular technician. And we have some of the best pictures in, 
in the universe of plaque. Like I try to get stuff from the internet. There is nothing like this. So this is a homogeneous plaque. This is the intimal line, uh, the, in the adventitial line right there. So all of this is plaque here, and all of this is plaque there. And uh, the lumen is between. These are calcified plaque with acoustic shadowing. Uh, here is the calcium, and the, the dropout here is because of the calcification causing acoustic shadowing. Like I promise you, this person is not bleeding from his artery. There is a back wall here. That back wall is, is basically uh, covered by the calcium in the near field. So the calcified plaque here is blocking this. Um, this here is a heterogeneous plaque with some calcifications in it. Uh, this one here has an, an echoic area, which is usually hemorrhage inside the plaque. You could see that here and here. Um, this one here, you could barely see the plaque. There is an echolucent plaque in here. But when you put the floor, you could actually clearly see that there is a plaque in that area. And those are very dangerous plaque with very high incidence of ischemic events. And if you intervene on those, there is a lot of potential for embolization. So this is an obstructive plaque, and there is a, a risk here to do embolization, whether you put a stent or you do an endarthrectomy. And uh, it may be without an obstructive plaque, an, an indication for a higher intensity statin, the way the Korean said in their studies. Um, this is the most scary picture, and we see two or three a year. That's a mobile plaque here, and, uh, and you could see it moving and that is, a, a, of course, a risk of embolization. He calls this the Osama Samuel slide because I asked to screen for atherosclerosis in a lot of young people. So here is a 33-year-old male with a calcified plaque here. So this has been there for a while. The calcification is at the tip. This is a woman at 41 with significant amount of homogeneous plaque. So basically, the train left the station. Uh, so. To get uh, uh, evidence for what I'm trying to sell you is required that we do decades of follow-up. Uh, uh, the investigators would not have the stamina. They wouldn't want to waste their life following it. Uh, it needs finance that will never get uh, come. They have to be an interesting party. No one is interested in a preventive strategy uh, using a generic uh, medication for 50 years. It's not going to happen. Uh, but I would prove to you that you would agree with me. I'll say you just bought a, a house. And, uh, and I came as an inspector and I did x-ray of the pipes in your house. And I, you just invested a million dollars in it. And I'll tell you that your pipes are starting to get clogged. And uh, you want to save your investment. Uh, if you do nothing, you know, in a couple of years, it'll get worse. So you will decide to take some water samples, look at things, get a filter, and take out as much junk as you can from the pipes. And you'll invite me back in a couple of years to look at your pipes again and try to catch it before it gets clogged. If common sense make you decide to do this way in the pipes of your house, why wouldn't that common sense prevail when we're dealing with the arteries of our body. Would any one of you, if he saw his arteries to look like any of the pictures that I showed you with plaque in it, would you decide to stop and say, I'm going to go follow the calculator and see if I qualify to start a statin, and I'm going to wait till I'm 10 years, uh, uh, 10 years close to the abyss and start the statin at that point? Or would you consider to start to clean the pipes from now so it wouldn't get clogged over time. Plus, it's so why start so late? We should be treating the arteries. We shouldn't be treating the risk factors. If we already have evidence that the arteries have atherosclerosis, we are treating atherosclerosis with a statin. And our monitoring should be for atherosclerosis. We shouldn't be measuring our success only by events, because if we do that, we'll allow more events to happen. We should be trying to abort the atherosclerosis, which is the disease that we are trying to treat. We are treating atherosclerosis, not treating events. And the idea by starting early and treating atherosclerosis, we may start a low dose and we can keep things under control. And I'll go through some of the slides now. Just a few points that I didn't make yet about PISA here is that 50% of the patients with cholesterol number that would be considered 
acceptable or normal based on the seven metrics that I told you have atherosclerosis already, meaning less than 200 milligram cholesterol, 50% have atherosclerosis. Um, some data are available now to say that we can abort or uh, 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 stop the progression of atherosclerosis below 70. And it's very strange. The British, the Canadian, the Australian, the European all kept the 70 milligram target because of this literature. Uh, in America, we have a problem with failure. We, we started to teach ourselves that we can never fail. And they felt that, uh, I heard that for the America, for diabetes, that the 6.5 was really the target that made a difference in mortality. But because 6.5 was hard, they decided we're going to make the target 7 for the A1C. Uh, same thing here. We, we found like sometimes we can't get the LDL below 70. So what do we do? We decided to make it a percentage based on no literature whatsoever. Like the uh, literature that showed that you could stop the plaque progression is 70. Uh, so they said lower it by 50% in the high risk patients and 30% in the moderate risk. Why? Why not go to 70, which every other part of the world is doing and that's where the stoppage of atherosclerosis. Just, just because we didn't want to fail when the LDL was 200. Let's not disappoint everybody. Let's try to drop it by 30% or 50%. To me, if your LDL is 90 and you're, you're taking rosuvastatin 10 and you have no side effect, I don't quite understand. Even if you went down by the 30% recommended, why wouldn't I go to 20 and get you to 70? Where I know that I'm more likely to avoid your atherosclerosis rather than just slow down your atherosclerosis and push your heart attack about four or five years. I want it to not happen in your lifetime, or I want something else to happen uh, before, hopefully by delaying it 20 years. So the target should be reached. We should go to 70 and maybe even below that to 55. Um, so, uh, however, it doesn't happen in all. And we have this situation here with this study, Galakov, which looked at PCSK9 inhibitor. And this one uh, showed that uh, you, you, you can still progress even though you went to below 30 milligram per deciliter. So, and the idea is that it's interaction between the artery wall and the cholesterol. However, in those patients, if you allowed the LDL to be higher, they probably would have had more rapid progression. So again, I'm trying to insist that even if your cholesterol is low and the patient is progressing, you should try to go uh, uh, even lower. Um, so here I'll go very quickly because I'm running behind as I expected. Uh, we have, uh, we are born with 60. If you took your umbilical cord blood, you're going to find that you're between 40 and 60. Most of us will go to around 100 at age 18. And by age 40, we get to 125 and stay stable. Of course, if you are born with familial hyperlipidemia, you will be uh, uh, starting with about 150 and you add another 60 in the first 18 years of life and you go above 190 for the rest of your life. And if you have a genetic uh, variant that give you very low cholesterol, you may start with a 20 and then your LDL will be 80 for the rest of your life. So that's how we can do Mendelian uh, regression. So um, this concept is by a very smart guy from Cambridge. And he basically say, if you, why are we looking at smoking as packs per year and not doing the same for cholesterol? So if your cholesterol's LDL is 125 and you live 40 years with that cholesterol, you got about 5,000 milligram a year under your belt here. And around that age is where you are just touching the idea of atherosclerosis and you may be at some risk of an MI at a very low risk. However, as you accumulate more L milligram per deciliter and more years into you, you get to this log scale increase in the age. And by age 64, you reach about 8,000. And he thinks 8,000 is the age where uh, 8,000 milligram a year is around where the mean number of mice happen. And, and if someone starts with 125, this comes around 65. If you, on the other hand, is born with 200, it may happen at 25 that you reach the 5,000 and close before age 40, you could be at risk of having an MI. If you have that genetic variant that I'm talking about and that your LDL, even after the primordial uh, increase go up to, uh, to only 80, 
you will get to your uh, beginning risk of heart attack at 64. But you know what? If you didn't get cancer or fall off of, uh, of the edge of the bed at age 85 or 90, you could get still a stroke at the end. So I just want you to understand that some families will have coronary artery disease and get sick earlier, and some families who have better genes will have it, but will have it much later. They're more likely to get cancer here and therefore not get the heart attack. But if they didn't get cancer, they will eventually reach the point to get the strokes and heart attacks. And that's why I don't discriminate. I may give a low dose statin even to my elderly patient because I still worry that they may not die of the cancer and I don't want them to get a stroke the last three years of their life. Nobody wants that. So my, uh, th this concept say like, if you try to go 10 years before you're 65 years of age where the MI is gonna happen, that's what the calculator is saying. Let's go 10 years before and start to bend that curve. I'm gonna lower your LDL from 125 to 80. So you're gonna follow that 80 curve and you're gonna go like this. So yeah, you're not gonna get your heart attack the, the 8,000 at this point, but you're gonna get it around here. You follow, like if you try to, cal to to bend the curve in the last 10 years just before the event, which what the, our guidelines are advising us to do, you're not going to bend it enough. You're just delaying your heart attack, but you could not really abort it because you cannot get the LDL to go from 125 to zero. You're going to make it go from 25 to 80. So the patient will continue to build milligram per year year after year, and you will hit the 8,000 no matter what at a later age. So don't start late. If we could start early, we will be able to get a much better bang for the buck. Um, he actually also did a lot of good research to try to figure out what is the reduction in, in risk uh, by milligram per deciliter. He did a Mendelian randomization, which is basically looking at people without uh, high cholesterol and high blood pressure. And, and uh, uh, they have genes that give them very low cholesterol and very low blood pressure and looked at their risk and compared them to others with a little bit higher uh, uh, cholesterol and high blood pressure. And by doing that, try to figure out what each one millimeter mercury per year of blood pressure increase the risk by and one millimole of LDL. Millimole of LDL is about 40 or 38 milligram per deciliter. So, uh, and he figured out those numbers and then he went, he was so smart and went to all the trials of LDL cholesterol and he proved that the reduction in risk on those trials, whether it's statin, niacin, fibrate, was exactly what he expected based on this calculation. And as a result, he came up with something in the America and the European Society of, uh, of uh, Cardiology that I, I, it was funny because I heard him yesterday uh, presenting it, and it was exactly things that I use uh, with my patient. And his idea is we can go to patients and tell them it's just like a financial advisor. Um, if you uh, invest in for your retirement, why don't you invest for your arteries? And, and uh, uh, like I would say the example, he really didn't go that way, but if say you, you come to us at age 40, already with high blood pressure and high cholesterol, it's, it's already like you, you have a debt. You, you, you went through college and you have a lot of debt. And now with knowing how many milligrams, uh, how much benefit I could get you by lowering the milligrams, uh, uh, millimole of, uh, of cholesterol and a millimeter of blood pressure, I can tell you now how steep I need to make that curve to, to compensate for what you had done, uh, what you accumulated already up to that point. Compare that to a 20 year old, uh, to someone who have low cholesterol and low uh, blood pressure who comes to us, he may not need to make a much a steep a drop in the blood pressure and cholesterol to reach say age 90. Like we can target with him, how long do you want to, uh, to not deal with heart disease? And you could decide based on the cumulative risks that the patient accumulated already up to that point how aggressive you want to uh, uh, bend the curve. Um, he put that model and he started to talk about this primordial prevention of the between two and 18 by healthy diet. Thank God he didn't recommend treatment for two year olds. 
but he uh, went all the way here and he started doing things that I have been doing for the last 15 years, which is that he look, he, he decided that I couldn't achieve optimal lipid levels. And if he couldn't, he said, I check if there is atherosclerosis is present on non-invasive imaging. And he said, if there is yes, I would add lipid lowering and or add lipid lowering and reassess or reassess in three years. And if, the, if there is progression, he would intensify the treatment. So basically that model was in Jack uh, uh, two years ago. It's the first model that is recommending something that I have been doing for 15 years. And I, I, I was finally like uh, happy to see someone is thinking the same way, look for disease, see if the disease progress and intensify. I just wanted to say you cannot use calcium score. Uh, once the calcium score is not zero, it loses value. Uh, it's good to look if for someone who's zero, who turned positive, but beyond that, you can tell if he's just calcifying soft plaque that he had already, or he added disease and then calcified it. So once the calcium score is anything other than zero, it cannot be used. And therefore, I recommend that you monitor the plaque burden and follow it. I don't use it by 3D. I do visual 2D uh, progression, but I use the same technician and the same equipment. And I'm looking at it in the computer and going back and comparing the studies to see if the patient progressed or not. So my final word, I hope I can finish in three minutes, is that this approach has to be tailored. You cannot say one size fit all. My LDL of 130 and your LDL of 130 lives in my body and your body. My bad gums, my, uh, my hepatitis C, my, my psoriasis can make me build more plaque than you. I cannot look at an LDL number or a blood pressure number uh, and, and just come up with the risk. The risk has to be tailored based on uh, uh, the individual. And one day we're gonna know genomes. I use cardiac CRP all the time. If it's high, I am more intense in my treatment because you may be inflamed. Uh, I use imaging and I monitor the imaging and I'm extremely aggressive uh, of all the other risk factors, the diabetes, the, the blood pressure. So in addition to lifestyle and treating the risk factors, I screen for atherosclerosis early in all patients. I have texts that are incredible and they are showing me every little plaque in the arteries. Of course, it matters how much plaque you have. A minimal amount is quite different than more extensive amount. And I use it even to assess a patient who comes in with chest pain. Like when I'm ordering a stress test, does it make sense that I don't know your carotid artery when it's accessible to me? when you're having chest pain, I want to know if you if you really have a, a high risk or not. Why am I judging by, by other things when I can look at your arteries? So I look at plaque, I don't look at IMT. I don't believe in IMT. I, I believe that if you don't have any plaque, I have to use the AS uh, as a guidelines, even though I think that I'm treating some of the elderly patient. If they don't have plaque, maybe they are the only one I shouldn't be giving a statin to. And um, anyway, I start early and I'm, I sustain. Do not remove the filter from your house's pipes after six months. Like if you have the, the pipes getting clogged, would you take the statin or put the filter for six months and then stop? It makes no sense. So obviously you will keep sustained treatment. And I use ezetamib and pimpidoric acid and, uh, and PCSK9 inhibitor. And if the triglyceride are high, I use Basepa. And I, talk, I tailor to the plaque burden and I tend to be aggressive if patient tolerates as based on the lifetime model, I want to go below 70 and if possible below 55. Based on the idea that even if they have mild disease in the young, I'm thinking of 50 years of prevention. So yeah, I would try to get them as low as I can. Regarding aspirin, if you're about to rupture your plaque in 20 years and I give you aspirin today, I'm going to give you inter, uh, gastrointestinal hemorrhage in five years, 15 years before you benefited from taking that aspirin. So I do not use aspirin for everybody with atherosclerosis. But if your father had a heart attack at 45, you're going to take an aspirin from age 40. Uh, because I'm worried that if you followed his footstep, I, I want the aspirin to be on board. Regarding inflammation, 
unfortunately, right now we're just starting to test those agents. We started uh, post MI. The cold cat tested it finally in patient with stable coronary artery disease. You guys can imagine that it's going to take us 15 years before we can move it to primary prevention. So even though we know it's an interaction between inflammation and LDL, we just can't have any recommendation or, 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 uh, or preventive strategy for primary prevention using an anti-inflammatory. So one day colchicine will be used and should be used, but today it's not there. So for now, treat your HIV, your hep C, get rid of your eczema, make sure your psoriasis is gone, make sure your IBD is quiescent, check your CRP, get your rheumatoid arthritis, get your gout under control, take your allopurinol, and make all the inflammatory condition, including go to your dentist every three months like I do, uh, because that reduces inflammation. I monitor your carotid today and every three years, and if you progress, I double my effort. And I trust me, I, I can't tell you how many patients quit smoking when I showed them the plaque. I can't tell you how many people took their statin because they saw their plaque. If they didn't see it, my tech show it to them, zooms, and I walk in, I say, you see this? It's just like the picture I showed you. You have it starting to build in your arteries. That makes a difference. And I asked Dr. Hannon to put this for me, like a linked device. And as soon as the cholesterol goes up, the fridge gets locked and that treadmill turns on. And this is a picture of my plaque. Any questions? Excellent. Dr. Samuel, thank you so, so much. It's 102, so I think we have to uh, we have to quit for the day. I really appreciate uh, this fascinating talk. Maybe we'll let people send questions to Ryan, and we can find a way to to get them to you and, and get folks some. Just answers. email me, guys, uh, Osama Samuel at uh, MountSignal.org. So uh, any question, I apologize. I knew I'm gonna go over an hour. I practiced it yesterday. I couldn't get it under an hour, so sorry about that. No problem. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.